For those familiar with the Old Testament, we're not going to have anything that's new to you, except in making application. For those who are not familiar, then this may, may be new to you. It is said of fleshly Israel, after God had delivered them from bondage in Egypt, they soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Psalm 106, verses 13 and 14. It's an amazing thing that they could have seen all the mighty works that God did that confirmed him to be God. And yet they immediately begin to go after other gods and ignore him. They're rebellious to him. Why didn't they constantly give thanks? But the scripture says they soon forget his works. They were ungrateful. You'll notice that one of the marks of people who leave God and desire not to retain God in their knowledge is found in Romans chapter 1. The Gentiles, when they left God, desired to not retain Him in their knowledge. Anyone today, or as long as time exists, who does not appreciate all that God's done for mankind that man couldn't do for himself is simply a person who is unthankful. He's ungrateful. Yet when we read through the whole of the Bible, especially the New Testament, we see that Jesus Christ left heaven and came to earth to suffer, to bleed, to die because of our sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, notice should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then we find this in the Hebrews epistle, chapter 2, verse 9, that we'll use along with this, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He didn't die for just a few people. He died for everyone. God's attitude is, I want all my people to be saved. But we're free moral agents. We have the power to choose to obey God or choose to disobey Him. Sadly, as you read the scriptures and just in your own lifetime, you see that most people aren't interested in God, certainly not interested in Him in doing exactly what He says. In Matthew 1.21, it is said of Jesus, He shall save His people from their sin. That was said at the time of His birth. And because he died, and because he shed his blood for each one of us, we can be redeemed. Knowing that ye were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 18-19. Then Paul, we would add on to that. In whom we have redemption through his blood even forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1, 7. Well, if ever a people should be grateful, we should. It reminds us of Psalm 107, 2. Then let the redeemed of the Lord say so. When we are thanking God for this, that, or the other, our redemption is one of the greatest things we could ever be thankful to God for. And if we are grateful, then we also want to teach the truth of the gospel to others so they can know, so they can understand the way of salvation. If we would follow Jesus, then we must go where he went, 
to lack of a better way to put it. We must be mindful of the poor and the lonely. Whatever their circumstances, they're lost in sin. They're separated from God. He said in Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And even though he was accused of consorting with sinners, the Lord did that because they needed him. Not because he was going to change his life to be the sinners they were, but because they needed the truth that he had. But his critics said, Right the opposite. But Jesus, likened himself to the great physician, which he was, spiritually speaking, said the whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick, implying that we must recognize our sick condition as it fits into what we're speaking of here before we'll ever go out to seek a physician to help us. And there's a reason for that, and that's because the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, John tells us, 1 John 4, verse 14. His mission was to the world. His mission is still to the world. And it is the spiritual body of Christ, the church, that is commissioned to take that gospel to the world. The ministry of Christ is set forth plainly in the book of Mark. Mark 6, 34 reads, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were his sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Shouldn't the church of our Lord, the spiritual body of Christ, have the same attitude toward all those around about us who are outside of Christ and who are following false doctrines and false philosophies? They are as sheep without a shepherd. And although Jesus did many miracles, he did many healings, he did all kinds of raising the dead, what really was his primary activity? It was teaching. It's characteristic of his ministry that he opened the mouth, the scripture says, he opened his mouth and taught them, Matthew 5, 2. You remember that Paul even asked to be remembered that he might boldly open his mouth and say what he ought to say. It's not always easy to say something to people that they actually need to hear, especially when they don't want to hear it. But it's what we do. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap in themselves teachers having itching ears and shall be turned away from the truth unto fables. And I mentioned many times over the years Brother Marshall Keeble's commentary on that it means to preach it when they want it and preach it when they don't want it we have an obligation to preach the word just as it appears in the bible when difficult teaching caused some to depart jesus then used that even as a teaching situation and said to those that didn't leave him will you also go away there reply was the reply all been ought to have Lord to whom shall we go thou hast the words of everlasting life John 6 and verse 68 I would ask anybody here or anybody anywhere for that matter if you turn from the teaching of the Bible specifically if you turn from the gospel of Christ you're going to turn to go to somewhere. You're going to leave it to go to somewhere. Now, where are you going? What's going to guide you? What's going to develop you? The master teacher 
was interested in saving the lost. It was and it is his ministry. Today, he's commissioned the church, each one of us, to go teach the gospel. Jesus, before his uh, ascension back to heaven, told his apostles that they were to go teach all nations. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Matthew 28, 19, Mark 15, 16, 15 to 16. And he gave the reason for his own death. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name unto all nations. Luke 24, 47. Notice the preaching that's to be done. Who's to do it? The church. And the early church, when you read in the book of Acts and elsewhere, did this, they were very serious about doing just what the Lord commanded. And they did it. That's always amazed me. They did it. The inspired apostle Paul wrote to the church in Colossae in verse, chapter 1, verse 23. Concerning the gospel, which was preached to every creature under heaven. Which was preached to every creature under heaven. No internet, no television, no movies. No jet planes, no printing press, no radio. To every creature under heaven. How can they do that? Well, you'll remember when the gospel was first preached publicly. We were told there were 3,000 that were added to the church. Acts 2, 38 through 47. And concerning those who were of the first church there in Jerusalem... They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers, Acts 2.42. When Jesus gave the account of the Great Commission that Matthew records, he said, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the Father, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lord, I'm with you even in the end of the world. But Acts 2, 47 says, we take this business of teaching everybody in the world seriously. It is part of continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And you can't find any place in the scriptures where they just sit down and waited for somebody else to give them something to do. They were a busy people carrying out the authority the Lord gave them. And the scripture says that they were doing that daily, Acts 2.46. And then we come to Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. Daily in the temple and in every house, notice, what were they doing? They cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Each one was teaching the truth of the gospel. Here's the result. Acts 6 verses 1 and 7. The number of the disciples multiplied. Then it reads, the word of God increased. That doesn't mean it became more of it. It means the impact and teaching of it influence more people. And the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Well, then they are under great persecution because of their teaching. They were scattered abroad after the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And the very thing that got them into trouble was the same thing they preached as they were scattered about. The apostles, the only ones staying in Jerusalem. You know, it's interesting. 
they did, as we would say, ordinary church members run off to Antioch because they were being chased out of Jerusalem and then call back to Jerusalem and say, send us a preacher. You can't find that in the Bible. <laughs> they taught as they went. Do you realize that was the actual wording of go into all the world, actually, it's as you go, you teach. Well, that's what they did. They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word, Acts 8, 4. What we do too much today is look around at our secular materialistic society and lament the fact that it's that way. What are we doing about it? When the gospel spread to other places, you'll see the same pattern that I've just been going over with you employed by the church. Notice Saul to become the Apostle Paul. When Saul was baptized, the scripture says in Acts chapter 9, verse 20, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. And this same man, as I said, he's now called Paul, spent three years in Ephesus preaching Christ. And during this time, because of persecution, he worked within the school of Tyrannus, teaching the gospel. And it says this is what happened because he did this. So that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. Acts 19, 9 through 10. Why is that in your Bible? When you read that, what does it do to your mind as a child of God, a member of the same church he's a member of? Paul wasn't the only one who was telling the story of the cross. Others certainly were doing it. They were being taught, and as they were converted, then they sought to convert others. Too many of us look for some great thing we can do. Is one reason we never get a whole lot done, period. And we neglect the opportunity that really, in doing that, that is set right before us. You'll remember that there was a man who was healed by the Lord, and he sought to show his gratitude by going with him, that is, going with the Lord and his disciples. Now think about this. That's what he wanted to do. But listen to what Jesus said. Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee. Mark 5:19. There's a place for everything and everything in its place. It might not get the acclaim and notoriety, but the Lord was interested in souls. He made that clear. We know much of the work of uh, Peter, the Apostle Peter. But let me ask you this. How much of the work of Andrew, his brother, do you know? you don't <laughs> but in John 1 verse 42 we read of this one small act of Andrew he first findeth his brother and he brought him to Jesus John 1 41 and 42 all the great work which Peter did Andrew had a significant signal part in it. One small act, it seemingly was so, but you just don't know how far that'll go. He brought him to Jesus. When the Lord talked religion, if you want to call it that, with the Samaritan woman, she was amazed, and of course she went out and reported it to her friends. 
Here's what she said. Come, see a man which told me all things ever I did. Is not this the Christ? John 4, 29. Well, the people on the basis of a word came out to hear Jesus. Verse 41 of chapter 4, many more believe because of his own word. She was telling what she knew. And they listened enough to her to come to the source of it and realize themselves. How many times we have an opportunity to invite somebody to a Bible study or to worship? How many times do we just stay after them to where they don't want to see us coming? <laughs> You see, we love their soul, don't want to go to hell, and we know where they're going. Are we willing to make a nuisance of ourselves to save a soul? I think Stephen did. Stephen made himself a nuisance. We're told it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2. The Lord has given us a job to do. And it's the same job that those disciples of nearly 2,000 years ago were given. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Paul wrote Romans 1 and verse 14, I am a debtor. Well, why would he say that? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I want all these people out here that are in bondage to sin to understand that I'm a debtor to bring them the way of salvation. So because he had the gospel, do we? The power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth. Then he was a debtor to those who did not have it. Are we? Thus you find him writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. So we have to ask, is our debt any less than his? Do we not have the same gospel? Have we not been blessed by it? Solomon wrote in the long ago, He that winneth souls is wise, Proverbs 11.30. When we consider the value of a soul, and do we ever stop and consider it? We should be moved to do our utmost to be soul winners. The Lord asked, what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. If we knew there was gold out there or some expensive whatever, something of high value, we'd go after that because there's a world of people out there doing that right now. But the Lord said, The fields are white unto the harvest, John 4, 35. But where are the workers? To seek and save the lost is our work. It's our mission. Everything the church is to do is connected with saving souls. Whether it's teaching the gospel to those outside of Christ, the alien sinner, or whether it's edifying the church to make us closer to God and keep us faithful, or whether we're mindful of those less fortunate than us in the sense of widows and orphans and people who are ill, people who need our comfort. All of it centers in on saving a soul from death and hiding a multitude of sins. It is the principal reason you exist as a, as a Christian. It is what we're to be doing. It, whatever is going on, really, in one way or the other, everything you see on this property has to do with saving souls. There's no use having this building or any other like it or having classrooms or having a place for a building except there's something it has to do with saving souls, with preaching the gospel, with defending the faith, with edifying the saints. So it's easy to sit back and wait for someone else to win souls. 
And some of us have uh, been around long enough where we haven't got much longer to sit back. <laughs> or to wait for someone to develop some kind of uh, soul-winning program. For if we fulfill the Great Commission, doing the best we can where we are in taking the truth to others and working to get them to study with us and inviting them to services, I don't think that it's going to be with all sorts of elaborate programs, such things as that. I think it'll be, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'm not saying it can't be done over television and internet and whatever. But I'm really amazed, and I'll close on this. I'm really amazed at all of the personal chatter that goes on in all these social whatevers. But how often do members of the church and all the New Testament means by that, do they raise the question about the salvation of your soul? In 2 Corinthians 4.13, Paul said, I believe and therefore speak. If we're grateful for Christ and the salvation he's given us, then we ought to speak the truth that saved us from sin. We ought to do all we can to reach people with the gospel of Christ. Now, what might happen... <laughs> When we reach this stage, the sermon is saying, yeah, but. <laughs> well, then didn't forget the sermon because it probably wouldn't do much good anyway. I guess those people at that time could have said, yeah, but, but obviously they didn't. So we need to be exhorted to practice what, there's nothing new, what we already know in striving to teach the truth to others. And if you don't know enough to teach it, I simply ask, whose fault is that? Whose fault is that? Someday we'll stand before the judgment bar of God to give an account of the deeds done in the body. And I've often thought about what I heard, and you've heard me say it, but it seems to fit right here. What the late Brother Thomas B. Warren said, and we were out somewhere, I don't know where it was. We were talking about the work of the Lord. And he said, I hate to go the Lord before the Lord in judgment, having done so little for him. Maybe we should look at things more that way regarding our own personal lives as to whether we are truly faithful stewards of the Lord. If you're not a child of God, now's the time to become one, to humble yourself to receive with meekness the word of the Christ, believe in him, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Rising from that watery grave of baptism, a new creature in Christ, resolve to carry the truth and defend it all the remainder of your days, short or long. As a child of God, if you've sinned, we urge you to repent of those sins. Repent of them, confessing them, and pray God for forgiveness. And we invite you to do that if you need while we stand and while we sing.